This is another episode of Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. And now the architects, Doug Pat and Stephen Chung. Well, you are watching or listening to the Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. That is Doug. How are you, Doug? I'm doing great, man. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. So this topic, uh, my little intro, is uh, having something to do with this FYI culture. Everybody thinks they can do it themselves. Um, do you mean designing. DYI? DYI. Oh, oh what did I say? FYI? Yeah. <laughs> DWI. <laughs> DWI? D- <laughs> do it yourself. Do it yourself. That's great. So do it yourself. Right on. Um, this culture where people, they think they could do it themselves. They can like, go on Google. They, I don't know if they go to the library, but basically research it and they figure, hey, I can figure it out and anyone can design their own home. And Maybe that's true. I don't know. So I kind of wanted to talk about that today. I mean, that's what this podcast is is about, after all. I mean, whether it's helping a homeowner to maybe try to design their own home or to help advise people and what this process, what to expect, even if they're going to hire an architect. But um, that's what this is about. So um, hopefully you have some some thoughts on the subject. I believe I've got some insights today. Yes. <laughs> All right. So as our usual format, uh, we both got three tips uh, related to the subject of designing your dream home and happens to be the Design Your Dream Home podcast. So uh, that's perfect. Okay. What's your first tip? Okay. So let me first say, if somebody wants to design their own home, they probably shouldn't. But if they're going to, uh, I think my three tips are going to be helpful today. So um, the first thing would be find a good site. Now that sounds really obvious. And, you know, most people that come to an architect have a pretty interesting site to build their home on. But there are times where, you know, architects get hired and we don't have the most awesome site. In fact, you know, I think I've done a couple jobs uh, for people who have very small pieces of property and they have houses right next door. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. But, um, one of the most important things is finding the right site. Now, interestingly, about a year ago, I had a friend come to me and he said, hey, Doug, uh, my wife and I want you to design our dream home and um, we want to get started. So let's have some lunch and we'll get rolling. So anyway, I met with him and we sat down and I said, oh, this is great. I'm really excited. Where is the piece of property that you've got? And he said, oh, we don't have any land yet. We just want to design our dream house. And I said, wow, what we really need to talk about this. And I went through and explained to him why it probably wasn't the best idea to go ahead and design a house with having a p- without having a piece of property. So a couple things to think about quickly. We've got to think about where the sun is when we've got a new house, right? Because the sun affects uh, the, the, the house in terms of heat and all kinds of issues there. Uh, what are the views going to be? I mean, can you imagine designing a house and not knowing, you know, where the views are relative to what you're doing on the interior? Uh, prevailing winds are an issue. We've got foundations for a house, right? So uh, whether or not we've got a rocky, rocky uh, we've got rocks or we've got soil, what's the weather conditions? And of course, things like zoning setbacks and permits and so forth. So find a piece of property and then hire somebody to design a house. If you're not going to hire them, uh, at the very least, have a start with a good piece of property. That's a good, that's a good piece of advice. You know, I actually find that many times I'm called in when the site has a problem. There's something difficult or challenging about it so that the builder can't do the usual thing and drop it. You know, it's a really simple sort of square site or whatever. They drop it in the middle and they can sort of do what they want to do. When suddenly the site is very narrow or it's got a kind of weird condition or something funky with the topography or as you say, it's rocky. There's something that makes it site more challenging, which, of course, I like. It, it makes it, it challenges us. It, it sort of excites me when there's something, I don't know, wrong, but there's something unique about it that uh, that gives gives us a, a chance to, you know, solve this problem. So, um, no, that's a good point. Site, is, site selection is is, uh, is critical. Okay, so my, my first tip, and it has to do with my, my sister, <laughs> because <laughs> she watches HDTV endlessly. And now let, let's just distinguish between design of my own house as being, let's say, a new house versus a renovation. So let's just say a renovation. So she watches HDTV, and in a half-hour episode, or let's call it 20, I think it's 22 minutes, really, <laughs> Um, we talk about uh, coming to commercial, coming back, and, and uh, sort of uh, recreating or explaining where we, where we were. Maybe it's 20 minutes. So, get a 20 minutes. 
somebody has in 20 minutes sort of renovated this house from sh- you know shambles to this beautiful this beautifully renovated place and it happened like like that and believe it or not that's not real <laughs> that's not real it's not how it works and um unfortunately i think you, you know when you see a prepackaged show these home runner motion shows it it gives people the wrong idea that it's so fast it's so easy um and that's just really not the case so if you're going to watch tv um i would recommend watching this old house uh, now yes. that's you know it's a little slow but you know what that's what it's really like those shows actually do a uh, house is really uh, shot over the course of the entire renovation from sort of beginning to end. Maybe an entire season is one house. So it's really, let's say, 13 episodes on one house. And even so, it's still compressed. But you really do get a feeling for what it's like to uh, renovate, let's say, renovate your own home, what's involved, all the different sort of characters, the subcontractors, all the issues that you'll encounter from beginning to end. And yes, oh, I've got to invest 13 episodes. You're going to build, a, renovate your house. I mean, is it sit down for 13 episodes and watch, watch, you know, one or two seasons, and you really do get, I think, a pretty good, um, I would say, straightforward, um, honest, pretty honest, uh, 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 inside look of what it takes to renovate a house. So uh, watch this old house. It's not a, I'm not a PBS, you know, PBS, I'm not working at PBS right now, so that's, that's all I'm trying to promote them. I just think that's a show that's done uh, pretty well. That's great. That's a, that's a great insight. I love the show. It's awesome. All right. What's your second tip, Doug? Uh, second tip, find a good plan. Uh, so as you know, as an architect, it's very important to have a solid plan that you're going to then elevate or, you know, create the elevations from and, and work toward, you know, building a house. So everything really starts with a good plan. An interesting story, actually, my cousin many years ago came to me and said, my husband and I want to uh, build a new house. And here's a sketch of the floor plan. And it literally looked like, you know, they had been working through lots of very challenging ideas, but it was an awful sketch and that nothing made sense, right? <laughs> right? So all the spaces, you know, everything was kind of jumbled and there were no smart proximities or adjacencies. There were no real doorways or hallways, a way to get from one space to another. And, and plus all of these, you know, kind of boxes were clumped together such that you could never put a roof on it, right? So she asked me, right. and you know, she innocently, she said, you know, do you think we could give this to our builder and have him get started? And I just, you know, it, it took a lot at the time to not totally lose control. But I said, you know what? There's very little that I can do with this. You know, we need to sit down and have a long discussion about what you're really after. And then I can put together a great plan at the very least, if you're not going to hire me, uh, hire an architect. And they did. They went and they hired an architect. And that's, you know, you know, the whole friends and family thing. And, and I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, we're told early in our careers never to work for friends and family, although that's really where all the initial work comes from anyway. But it worked out great. They got a great architect who did it for a good price. And the home is absolutely beautiful. But it all starts with a plan. So I'd say to people, if you're not going to use an architect, think about the homes you've been in that you really like. I mean, that happens to all of us. We go out somewhere, we go to a friend's, we walk in and we're like, wow, I love the way this feels. This is interesting. It's it's cozy or it's wide open. Whatever is interesting to you, think about that when you go to other people's houses, if you're starting to think about designing your own home. And I would also say, and you're going to think I'm nuts, but I love the Sears homes. So if you go to searsarchives.com, Sears company back in 1908 started a business where they designed houses and you got the Sears modern home catalog and you could go through that catalog, pick a house, and then they would ship it by boxcar to you on the railroad. And then uh, trucks would gather uh, at the station and, and bring the house to you and they would build it right there. So what a, what an interesting, beautiful way. But anyway, mm. go to that website and somebody has carefully taken their catalog and laid it out by year. These are some of the most beautiful homes in the world. I mean, I started out in traditional architecture and ended up working for somebody doing very contemporary stuff, but I love traditional work. And although it's called modern architecture, of course, it's 1908. But take a look at these homes because there are so many ways a, a home can be planned, you right, know, can right. be laid out. 
And these, the catalog gives you a really wonderful feel for very simple ways of laying out your home that you can then later elaborate on. So find a good plan if you're going to design your own house. Now, I imagine those plans from 1908, the kitchen is probably considered a service space and yep. not uh, reflective of our current times. So Absolutely. You but think you, about that. Yep. No, that's a great point. And I should note that they go from 1908 to 1940. So there, there are definitely, you know, more contemporary ways to lay out the plans, but they're really unique, interesting ways. And these are the kinds of things that people look at when they're driving down the road and they see a Sears home. And they think, wow, that is beautiful. They're just striking and they're wonderfully designed. So when you talk about plans, we should just also underscore that um, it's not a style issue. It's really more about um, certain spaces, their relationship between spaces, yep. the, the size of those spaces. So let's yep. talk about, I think, and often in suburbs, the front door, uh, we think of as the front door is rarely used as the front door. The front door is really more that the space maybe next to the garage or it's that side door that becomes often a front door for the family let's say yes um often the living room is a a formal space which is not used and sometimes these days people are not even having that living room or the kitchen has become a much more of an entertainment space it's almost a family room entertainment space so i think be mindful of those kind of thoughts when thinking about a plan um, maybe an older home doesn't really have a lot of these elements. Maybe it's more stylistic when you're looking at an old home, but in terms of the relationships, maybe a more contemporary home. Um, maybe when we talk about you know, a plan, it's really more about a series of different spaces, how they're related to one another, what that, um, and, and how you, let's say, whether you like that or not like that, and make a mental note of that or jot that down or even make a little scribble that somehow the way that this living room is connected to that dining room it's really open it's something you really like and you sort of square that away or put that away for another day so that's no, i'm glad you added that i completely agree absolutely so what's okay, your second so, tip well you talk about resources and we talk about the sears catalog that was interesting because i do have a lot of these older books from the, the those early days mostly i like them because i like the the pencil renderings but anyway yeah. um so i think it's very interesting clients um uh, more recently have been using uh, services like pinterest and house Yep. Uh, to create, I think, I think in house they call them idea books or Pinterest, I'm not sure what they're called, but basically they create folders of images. They collect images that they find online. They categorize them into different spaces, often either contemporary, traditional, or maybe it's living room, dining room, furniture, whatever it is. And I found those to be very useful. Um, I think in the old days we would sort of clip pictures from Dwell Magazine or some architect magazine or Metropolitan Home and, and sort of put them in a big folder. And often clients would come with these big folders and by the way, they were help. But um, now with images so, so easy to find and, and to, 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 to share, um, I, I, I strongly recommend using, you know, one of these sites, whether it's Pinterest or House and, and to collect images. Um, I think it's the same story with the plans. I think you're collecting these plan ideas, you're collecting all of these visual images, inspiration images, how they really kind of meld together. I think like you, you do need an architect or someone to help with that. But but I think just basically having all this information constantly sort of pulling it in, putting it in a place um, where you can sort of look at it, um, really see, again, these abstract plans with all of these concepts and images um, is, is a really important part of the process. And if you do end up hiring a professional, design professional, sharing those elements, those things that you've collected over a year or two years or however long it is, five years, whatever, 10 years, it's so valuable. It, it, it means it, we've seen, that means we've sort of seen, we see what um, you like, what um, what excites you. Um, when, you know, I look at 500 images from somebody, uh, parent, you know, obviously patterns begin to emerge and I really get a, a, a good sense of what that person is yeah. looking for. It takes out the guesswork. So. I find that entire um, that entire process uh, very helpful for both homeowner, but also for a design professional. I love when people give me those folders, and I can really see where they've been, what excites them, what interests them. So, um, again, either way, whether you're going to sort of try to do it on your own, um, or you're going to hire a professional. In either case, I would definitely recommend collecting images from from different services like uh, again Pinterest, House, or wherever, even Google Search, and just dropping them into into different uh, folders. Agreed. All right, Doug, what is your third and final tip on the subject of designing your dream home? My third tip is think about style. Now, not that people don't think about style, but, you know, you get some people say, I want a traditional house. Other people say, I want a modern house. And someday, actually, we need to do a show on the word modern and what yep. that means, meant, 
how we use it today. But anyway, so we've got traditional home, we've got contemporary homes, and there are lots of stylistic variations within all of that. So that's where I think your point about this whole house thing or Pinterest, you know, people saving images of stuff that they're really into, mm -hmm. super important so that we can get a sense for where they're headed. Now, right. all of that said, all the things that we both said, we've got a piece of property and many times that property is going to limit the kind of style that we can pursue as architects. Now, that is not to say that you can't put a modern house right next to a traditional house, but we know, you know, we've all gone into those neighborhoods where you've got the cookie cutter home designs, and then you've got the one guy, the one modernist, you know, that built a 1930 uh, style modern home. And it has, you know, it's not, it's the one house in the neighborhood not only looks different, but never sells, you know, every time it goes up for sale. So this is my house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. I mean, look, for some of us, that doesn't matter, right? I mean, you can you you don't care about resale. And many of our clients could care less, couldn't care less. Interestingly, in my neck of the woods, when you build, uh, you design a house, and you build it, and it, you know, it's a ten million dollar home. Most likely, the next guy to buy the property is just going to rip it down and start over again anyway. So it really doesn't. That kind of thing doesn't matter in some neighborhoods. Not to say it always happens that way, but you know, that's you know, that's the way the world works. Anyway, you got to think about style when you're designing your house, and you know, if you've got lots of homes next door and you want to do a, a traditional home, well, maybe there are ways that we. Can can, you, can, you can vary the style somewhat. Like I said, you know, there's lots of variations within all of these stylistic worlds. So anyway, you've got to think about style. I think it's a great point, saving images that you can give to the architect. If you're not going to do it yourself, you're saving images and then you're working toward those and you're handing it over to a draftsman or a contractor and they're giving you, uh, they're trying to get you what you want. So thinking about style is uh, super important. Yeah, this is really this is a really important issue because um, and I think we'll have to have a longer discussion about this uh, another time. But you know, with my own house, I wanted to make a contemporary house. The area where I live is is colonials, it's capes, so the house cl clearly stands out. And I needed to uh, present this project to our local authority to sort of demonstrate that the house would somehow be appropriate for this neighborhood. And I had to find a couple of homes that were within a couple of miles away that were similar modern type houses, contemporary houses, before they would even grant approval for me to do this modern house. And now just to go beyond that, but I went to the bank to get a loan. You know, the oh, bank wow. is really concerned about, um, let's say I default and I can't uh, pay for my loan. They're going to have to sell this house. Is this contemporary or modern house going to be able to sell? Sometimes they don't feel comfortable. They're not willing to sort of um, um, give you that loan. Uh, others, they may say, they may say, well, can you make it a little bit more look like things that are around it? Uh, or they say, maybe we'll, we'll charge you a higher rate. But meaning, meaning for me to do something a little bit different, it, yeah. it cost. It costs. It costs in terms of, yeah. you know, maybe someone's not willing to support um, my vision or back me in a way just because it's something different. So this style issue is really important. I mean, I, I'm building a house in Florida or Sarasota where mo there's a lot of contemporary modern. It's fine. New England, it's a challenge. Um, yep. And so for me, I had to be committed and um, we'll see if, I'm, I, again, I'm not a house that's maybe not going to sell ever. And oh, well, <laughs> I like my house. It's, it's okay. <laughs> So what's your All right. third tip? My third tip uh, has to do with um, a homeowner plus a builder, homeowner working with builder, or homeowner working with an architect that then works with a builder. And of course, I know what your response to this is, but let's say that you have a homeowner who's motivated, who's willing to spend lots of time, do a lot of research, collect the right plan, as you had mentioned, do some great site evaluation, find a really great site. Um, collect a series of plans, go on to Pinterest and house and collect all of these images, they really feel like they've got a really good sense of things. And they're able to take all this information and bring it over to a builder and say, look, here's my basic plan concept. Here's images that kind of tell you what I want this to look like. Can you take it from here? So that, as opposed to, let's say, uh, same, same homeowner, homeowner, giving that information to an architect, um, why would I do one versus the other? And actually, this is kind of a question. So I kind of want to, what is your your feeling about those two sort of options? Do you think that first option is viable? 
giving it to a contractor? Well, but again, you're motivated, you, you've done the research, you have a great site, you've got some good plan ideas, you've got the images, and you say, look, I've done all of my work. Yeah. Can I come to you and can you, Mr. Builder, can you take this and translate this and make, make my dream home? Well, it all depends on the person. Uh, my experience, just looking at it from as an outsider, I know GCs that have decent draftsmen they don't know what the hell they're doing. I mean, it's, and I don't mean to be unkind. I know there are, I know draftsmen. I had a guy who edited one of my books. He's a draftsman and he could easily have been an architect. He's got easily the amount of knowledge I have. Um, but you really, you've got to go to school and then study architecture as a student You're for a long time to be good at the job. So I, I again, I, I do not mean to be demeaning. I'm just saying that I, I think it presents a challenge. I think translating information and having the experience to do it well, because you have both the knowledge and the education to put it all together is very, very challenging. So handing it over to a contractor, I say GC, general contractor, I think you're going to have more challenges and you're not going to get as good a design as handing it over to an architect. What do you think? All right. So what I my thought is, I, you know, I've used this example in the past. And I, I think it's maybe not a great example, but I've, I've thought about I've got some kind of health issue and I go online, I do all this research. Um, I think I know what it is. And then I try to self-medicate and maybe I've got a back issue and I think, Oh, I know how to solve this problem. Um, or do I go to the doctor <laughs> so I, and I, you know, say, can you look at what I have here and use your equipment and tell me if I, you know, I need an x-ray or I need whatever, uh, in your experience, your expertise, knowing me and my physical history and all of these things, what do you think is wrong? Say so you have a pinched nerve. We need to uh, we need to do this um, uh, series of uh, exercises to so alleviate the pressure that's on your. I can see this the the, the X-ray. What's pushing on this is V whatever L5 vertebrae. Yeah. How would I know that? Right. You know, I, I did all this research and but this is a true story, right? So I did all this research. I went online. I read everything. I exercised. I talked to trainers. I you just can't know all of these things. And yeah. I just don't know why um, people would would sort of would sort of take, you know, the biggest investment potentially of their lives. Um, and I, I know it's, it's always about issue about cost, let's say, but why wouldn't they try to find and seek out the right professional to help them in this really big, complicated decision? You can have all the information. You can be motivated. You can all this. All this. That's great. We like that. I love that as an architect. I love when someone comes like that. And I love that there's a great, a potentially a, a builder that you really like. I love that. That's fantastic. But I work for you. I'm going to help you translate all of this information you've given me. I'm going to be the intermediary between you and this builder, and the three of us together are going to make this wonderful project. And it's not going to cost more because I was there. It's going to cost maybe the same, and maybe if we're really clever and very smart, less. So, yeah. I mean, you know our feelings about this. I mean, right, I this, know. Is, this, is, <laughs> this is the same old thing. Right, but we all make the same mistake. I mean, we all, in, with other things, It's your example is perfect, like this medical thing. You go online, you do all your research, you think you, you got it nailed, problem doesn't go away. There's, there's always, going to a professional, always going to get a different set of eyes looking at something, and you're always going to get some uh, a better or a more, uh, uh, more valuable response from them. So anyway. Okay, fantastic. Now, Doug, um, to wrap up today's episode on Design Your Dream Home, yeah. Uh, we have a question, and this is a good question. Hi, Doug and Steve. We are considering building a new house, but have heard nightmares about cost overruns during the process. We are attracted by the cost certainty that building modular presents. What do you think about this approach, modular? Oh, I like it. Uh, okay. Again, so let's step away from architect hat here. Okay. And we'll just talk about what, you know, um, we'll talk about it as it is, right, outside of design. So I'm not a huge fan of what most modular buildings look like. 
Mm-hmm. However, from what I understand, if you go to a good modular home company, you can have some control over design. And so what I would what I would challenge anybody thinking about modular to do is perhaps, you know, work through with them what you're looking for, bring lots of images and talk to them about it. And then maybe you hire a designer, a draftsman or an architect to look at what you're doing and step it up a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the wonderful things about being an architect is we have all these constraints around us, right? Especially when it comes to zoning and building codes. So you've got to, you've got to work within a system of constraints already. And architects love that because we're problem solvers. And if you look at buildings today, they're only getting more interesting, right? They're not getting less interesting. And yet we have even more restrictions than we ever have had before. So that means to me, it says to me that we can still do modular home and we can do it well. So I'd find a way to do it well. But I love this idea that, you know, they're handing over, they're basically, you know, handing you a template. They're saying, build, you design a house. This is, these are the, uh, you know, these are the forms that your building can take. Go for it. So I think it's an interesting idea. I've never done it myself, so I could be wrong here, but that's my opinion. Now, I've waded into this territory before, and I liken it to um, uh, um, a Mini Cooper and buying a Mini Cooper. I mean, you really have the opportunity to customize the Mini Cooper, build it the way you want to build it with all the different options. And this, in the case of a modular house, it might be a kitchen countertop or the window or the color and on and on and on. And it's all built in a factory. And when they talk about cost certainty, it means because it's built in this factory, you don't have weather, you don't have all the other issues that somehow affect construction. You really do know the cost. So when I configure a Mini Cooper online and I know it's $22,422, that's what it's going to cost and it's going to be delivered to me in three months, something like this. So that is very attractive. Um, and I tell you, in terms of a bank loan, it's very attractive to a, to a lender. It's very attractive because they know what they're getting. They know there's cost certainty. Um, you know, and, and we can talk about modular all day. I mean, I think different opinions about it. We'll have to have another topic about that. But I think it's a really interesting road to go down. But I like your idea that it doesn't mean that you have to um, not still work with a designer. I think it's not a bad idea as a consultant to have somebody to still oversee, um, help you to um, explore different options, even beyond uh, the you know the salesperson at the modular company. I think it's still yes. it still can be very helpful for you to have someone look and see really what's possible because they understand all the different components and, hey, you know what, we really could still do the master bath the way you want it because I understand the way these components work. It's not what they all usually do, but it's not for them. It shouldn't cost any more. I think it's just something they haven't thought about. So I still think that it's uh, it's worthwhile to have as a, a consultant, let's say, in that in that process. But yeah, modular is very interesting. I think it's, uh, you know, good luck to this person and um, I think it's not a bad approach. Very cool. Hey, one thing I wanted to add uh, about finding a good plan that I have on my notes here. Um, what I've had a number of clients come to me and say, hey, Doug, we already have a great design for our house. Um, I just need you to make a couple changes to it, and then we're going to move ahead with the general contractor. Now, I do not take that kind of work simply because I know they're already trying to save money. And many times, once we, you know, once we start making changes to a plan, in my experience, they make lots and lots of changes. It just gets bigger and bigger, and eventually they get fed up with having to pay an architect to do that. All of that said, I love these plan books. I know, you again, you must think that I'm talking out of two sides of my head, but I think when you go on the internet and you look at some of these websites with these plans, you've got, they've got plans and elevations of houses, it's a great place to start. So if, mm-hmm. if you haven't been in a home, uh, where you find the the plan that you really like and you, and you you know you don't see it on Sears because these are really old examples. You can find great plans in these plan books. What I would say is, please purchase the plans. I mean, the people that I have spoken to in the past where they say we want to make some changes and we want to get rolling, they photocopied them, you know, or they printed them off of the computer because they don't even want to buy the the actual plan drawings. And they think somehow that magically they're going to pop into my computer so that I can make the changes. I mean, they really don't understand the process. At least if you spend a couple hundred bucks, you get some DWG files, we can manipulate them and we can, you know, alter the the, the house and really turn it into something that they that they want or they get a draftsman to do that work. So I like these plan books. I think, again, they're a great place to start. So I just wanted to add that. 
I'm going to also add one extra free bonus tip. Go for it. Do you like chess? Do I like chess? You know, I learned to play chess, but I'm not very good and I don't do it very often. I, I find um, plan doctoring, uh, that's what people who call me a plan doctor, or people who are fairly quick manipulating plans and yeah. uh, cycling through options. W when someone sees, often a homeowner will see a kind of a functional, something's not right in the plan and they suddenly start stressing about it. And I said, don't worry about it. I said, what's the problem? I said, I'm, I'll cycle through about 20 options in about five minutes in my <laughs> head or on a piece of paper. It's kind of like chess. When you play chess, you really look at all the moves on the board and you're like, okay, if I do this, that's going to happen. If I do this, that's going to happen. If I do that, that's going to happen. This is going to happen. And you kind of have to think ahead and you sort of cycle through all these different options. And um, I think these three are worth really exploring in further detail. And the next day or maybe the next hour or whatever, I say, here, what about these? And they say, well, how did you do that? And it's, it's just through experience. It's, there's, you know, probably 42 different ways to do it, probably 16 that make sense and four that have a good potential given what you need. And you cycle through them fairly fast. And it's not a brag thing or anything like that. It's just that's sort of what we do every day. I mean, we sort of, how many different ways can the kitchen connect to the dining room? I mean, probably 11. Let me just, we figure it out. So I think that's kind of what we do. I mean, I think that the, you know, I don't know if you even call this, but kind of plan doctoring, just kind of yeah. looking at the plans. And again, if it doesn't work right away, it doesn't bother me. I just said, oh, we'll figure it out. We'll, talk, we'll yeah, sort yeah. of jiggle things around and and, and uh, toss it around and it'll come back and it'll 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 find it it'll work it out yeah we won't have to sort of big chamfered corners and diagonals and try to jam <laughs> things in there to make them you know right. as, as when you can sort oh. of see when you look at someone like that you're like this guy has no other you know they have no no idea what they're doing so the dreaded 45 exactly so uh yeah <laughs> that's anyway. tactical thinking right there that's tactical it's thinking. not strategic thinking it's tactical tactical thinking and you're hired by the way i play chess <laughs> i used to play chess all the time all right, Doug, you want to you wanna close out this one? Yes, sir. So you've been watching the Design Your Dream Home show with Doug and Steve. See you next week.